Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 303. No one saves us but ourselves. No one can and no one may. We ourselves must walk the path. Buddha. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Black Box. Black Box is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. And today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. If you want access to filmmaking documentaries, feature films about filmmaking, interviews with some of the top screenwriters and filmmakers in Hollywood, as well as educational online courses all in one place, IFH TV is for you. Just head over to IndieFilmHustle.tv. Now, before we start the show today, guys, I wanted to let you know that I am now going to be releasing every Monday a Monday motivational video. I'm going to call it Weekly Motivations. And this week's motivation is what to do if your film career is going nowhere. It's a quick three-minute video. I'm going to try to do these every week because I I found that you guys are really liking this new series of uh, podcasts I'm doing and kind of more motivational, inspirational stuff. And God knows we all need it every once in a while, no question. So it's a good way to start off your Mondays. So if you want to check those out, just head over to my YouTube channel and subscribe. Go over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash YouTube, and it'll take you right to the uh, channel. And please subscribe, and make sure you turn on the notifications, that little bell that's right next to the subscribe button. That way, every time I put up a new video, it will be sent directly to your email. So thanks, guys. Now, today on the show, we have... Glenn Reynolds. He is a producer's rep and sales agent. And Glenn and I have been friends for a while now. He's uh, I got I got connected to him by another uh, guest of ours, Sebastian Tordas. Uh, and they're both with Circus Road Films. And Glenn is one of the good producer's reps. If you guys remember my scathing review of producer's reps back uh, when I first started, I think it's episode three or four. Glenn and I actually became friends <laughs> because of that scathing podcast that I did against producers reps because there are a lot of producers reps out there and sales agents that will just steal from you straight up and smile while they take your money. But Glenn is definitely not one of those guys. He is one of the good guys. He really cares about his filmmakers. He really goes the extra mile. And I wanted to bring him on to kind of get an idea of how you do pick a good sales agent, how you do pick a good producers rep and what they do, how they do it and how it's changed a lot in the last three and a half years since my last uh, producers rep podcast. So this is going to be really eye opening for every, anybody out there thinking of using a producers rep or sales agent to get their movie out there into the marketplace. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Glenn Reynolds. I'd like to welcome to the show Glenn Reynolds, man. Thank you so much for taking the time out to uh, to talk to the tribe today. Absolutely. Very happy to be here. Now, of course, Glenn is uh, an amazing producer's rep with Circus Road Films, but he also moonlights as an actor uh, on the side uh, because he was in my film On the Corner of Ego and Desire as a maniacal bartender at the the world-famous Sundance uh, party that uh, they throw every year. So thank you for your yeah, performance. Yeah, I'm very particular. I only work with one director, and that's Alex Ferrari. <laughs> I, so. I appreciate that tremendously. Thank you so much. You were fantastic in the part, sir. And, thank uh, you. And if we do get sold for millions of dollars, it will be uh, strictly on your shoulders. Uh, uh, no doubt. <laughs> so before we get into it, man, first, how did you get into this film business in the first place? 
Well, I always been a film freak from, you know, five, six years old watching Disney movies and whatnot. Um, and that parlayed a little bit into wanting to be an actor in mm -hmm. my, in high school. And then actually moving to New York to study acting at the neighborhood playhouse. Mm -hmm. Um, so I always had an interest in, in theater and movies as an art. Um, and then I kind of did the math. I, I didn't, I just didn't feel like I was probably good enough to bust ever, you know, bust out of being a waiter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I decided to go to law school and I went back to Texas, got my law degree, um, about halfway through decided I didn't want to be a lawyer, but decided I better finish. And once I got out, I headed out here to interview with various people just to try to get in the film business. Cause I was still just, that was, you know, I think I spent more time in law school, law school, watching movies than actually cracking books. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and so I fell into a job, um, with an international sales agency, um, just sitting on a, at a desk, answering phone calls with my law degree in the drawer. <laughs> and, um, one thing after another, they didn't really have anybody like spearheading acquisitions. So I kind of organized that. Um, then a business affairs person left and I said, Hey, I've got a law degree. I can do that. I started doing that. Um, and they were starting, they were producing a movie here and there. And so I, you know, I started reading scripts and trying to help with production. And so by the end of it, I was kind of doing a little bit of everything. Um, and I was there for about eight years and worked for another company for two years. And then I just decided I wanted to work for myself. And I kind of accumulated these various, you know, skills in terms of legal and aesthetic and under, you know, understanding the, the, the ways of, of independent film. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I hit, hung up my shingle to, you know, say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to start trying to help filmmakers get distribution. That's, that's the, the long short story of it. So you, so you're like Liam Neeson and Taken. You have a certain set of skills. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, um, precisely, precisely. Um, I say, yeah, I, um, yeah, I've always been kind of, you know, interested in doing lots of different things more than being, um, you know, specifically interested in, in, in producing or, or, or selling or acquiring or, so I've always kind of um, been entrepreneurial, even when I worked for other people. And I've always, even when I worked for um, international sales agencies, I always felt like I had more of a filmmaker perspective on things than a sales agent perspective on things. Mm -hmm. um, I always felt for them when they weren't making the money they didn't, they didn't make. And always felt like I was going to bat for them internally in terms of what they were hoping for in terms of marketing and publicity and, and transparency and things like that. So, um, yeah, I just was kind of a, I just kind of was a natural fit to, to, to lead me to something that, you know, kind of incorporated different parts of my, my personality. Yeah. You have, you do, you, you have a lot of uh, hats. You wear a lot of hats. It's not just one thing. Uh, you've produced features, you, work in distributions, you work with festivals, you, you do a lot of, and you act of course on the side just for me, <laughs> yes. um, but you do, you are a, you are a hybrid without question. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I think it's what's kept me kind of in the business and doing, you know, uh, surviving through, you know, what's been, you know, at one point when I first got in the business, the independent film business was, was gangbusters and there was, you know, cable channels around the world that wanted indie films and, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and, D and DV and, and blockbuster type stores around the world that wanted films. And since all that's kind of declined, I think it's, it's helped that I kind of can do a few different things to, you know, keep the, keep the chum rolling <laughs> as they say. So then you are arguably a producer's rep, <laughs> not arguably you are a producer's rep. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of a, you know, it's a bit of a misnomer, I think, because, you know, you don't, you're not really representing a producer per se, as mm -hmm. you are trying to help place a film mm -hmm. in distribution. You're trying to help sell it per se or license it. Mm -hmm. um, 
And but what goes along with that kind of, you know, there, there, there are different kinds of so-called producer rep. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some people who just purely have got a sense of the business and learned who buys films and, and looks for films and tries to sell them. Um, I have a little bit of, you know, advantage in that I've got a legal background. So I, you know, arguably can look at a contract a little bit more closely than, than some other producer reps. Um, but then I also compete with people who are sales agents who, who do the same thing. Yeah. You know, what is the difference? Of- what's the difference between a producer rep and a sales agent? Well, most, you know, um, the way I, the way I would look at it is a sa- most sales agents when they represent themselves as sales agents are really take, taking over a film per se and, and probably doing international, mm-hmm. right. Uh, going to the markets, uh, the Marche du Film at Cannes and the AFM and the European film market and the MIPCOM, MIP TVs. And they have a booth and they meet with distributors from around the world every 30 minutes mm-hmm. and show the movies and sell to them. Um, and to do that, they really have to kind of take over. So they're kind of a quasi distributor in that you deliver as the filmmaker, you deliver the film to them. They then um, go and make the contracts directly between themselves and the distributors overseas. Um, those distributors, you know, pay and are delivered by the the, the producer. I was sorry, not, sorry, with the international sales agent, and then that sales agent reports to the producer on a quarterly basis, just like a distributor. Um, so it's, and it, pays them. So it seems like it's almost like a, another middleman in the, in between you and a distributor. It's definitely a different kind of middleman. And it's in, in a way, if you have a film that's worth, you know, that's, a, you know, that, that, that has an international sales agent, you almost mm-hmm. need one unless you really want to be one yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. Because, um, as an international sales agent, you have to stay on top of who are all the different distributors in the various territories, what do the contracts look like? You have to, there's, you know, there's different um, ways films are delivered to those, those countries and those, those platforms around the world. So it's a bit of a, I mean, things are changing a lot because there's less opportunity Mm -hmm. in the international world for true indie films. And a lot of people are taking worldwide deals and just doing digital that, that goes across different territories. Mm -hmm. But if you, but if you just, if you just go by what they do for films that have value in that market, it's just that you need someone that that does it, that gets their teeth, you know, sunk in a little bit deeper than what I have to do. At the end of the day, I'm just, as a producer rep, I, I think of a producer rep as someone who specializes in selling films to the U S market. And, in order to do that, I don't have to be the middleman that actually collects the money mm-hmm. and then reports to a filmmaker. I can just set up that deal directly, and then the filmmaker can pay me my share as they get it. Mm-hmm. You just don't need someone to, to sink their – you don't need someone to, to deliver. You don't need someone to do all the things you have to do to sell to all the international sell, the territories. Now, sometimes those international sales agents also – sell the U S so mm-hmm. they, they do the same thing we do, but they go about it a bit differently, um, in terms of how they handle it. Now I early on, um, which is a funny story because we, you and I have met through a, a, a mutual friend of ours, Sebastian Tordas, who's been on yeah. the show and, uh, I've co-hosted, uh, things with at Sundance. And originally when I first launched, uh, Indie Film Hustle, I did a scathing podcast <laughs> scathing podcast on producers reps because yes. i was screwed by someone who she will remain nameless but you know who she is um and uh, as everybody in the business does <laughs> yes. and so i'm in good company where i was basically taken for a lot of money and a lot of promises were made and all this kind of stuff so there was there are a lot of those kind of shysters out there the reason I brought you on the show is because I know you, I, I've known you for a while, and I know what you guys do at Circus Road, and you're one of the good ones uh, without question. So that's why I, I brought you on the show. But what should we look out for with some of these, let's call less reputable producers yes. reps? Well, there's – there's your story um, is not a solo one, mm-hmm. right? There's There are definitely lots of people that have had really bad experiences with producer reps and sales agents 
that um, are are just not honorable. Um, and the main way to find out whether or not someone is is good at what they do and does what they're going to and does what they say they're going to do is to go through IMDb mm-hmm. and um, look up the films that they've um, sold and where where they've mm-hmm. placed them. Um, if they've actually had films at Fox or Sony or Warner Brothers or Magnolia or whatever, mm-hmm. and to call and if they can to email or call those filmmakers and find out what their experience was. Um, now, everybody has people that don't like them. No, of uh, course. I haven't, I haven't pleased a hundred percent of my filmmakers by far. Um, and at the end of the day, if a film doesn't do as well as they expect, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to blame the distributor and the sales agent and to look at your own film and think, well, it just didn't quite work. Mm-hmm. Um, but you at least can, if you, if you do enough of them, I wouldn't stop with one. I, you know, if you can look at how long they've been in the film business, look at the film. Do you like the films that they've sold? Do you know, are there eight to 10 people that say, yeah, they're, you know, they do what they say they're going to do. Um, that's the, you know, that's the, um, I mean, you could always just call me and I could tell you <laughs> who's bad and who's good. Um, but I, I'm a little bit biased. So I, right. you know, it's definitely good for people to do their own homework. Mm-hmm. Yeah, w- without question. I've actually gotten phone calls about that other producer's rep over the years. People asking me about her and I would be – I would be honest. <laughs> I would say run, run, run away. Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, there's – there, and there's still um, – I don't know if she's still in the biz because I haven't heard her name in a while. But, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about her um, and uh, and then we will move on. <laughs> yes. I saw her at AFM last year. Oh. oh, I went into my international distributor's office and the the other distributor that was being shared, uh, sharing that office with, she was sitting right there. And I'm like, <gasps> oh, my goodness. Got, she wasn't the distributor, but she was meeting with the distributor. And yeah. I'm like, I can't believe – no – F and way. Did you just tell, I didn't out. say I didn't get say I I now. didn't say a word. <laughs> I didn't want there to be a scene. Yeah. Um oh, man. but it was uh, I could not believe that she was still bumping around after all the damage she's done over the years. But um anyway, enough about her. Uh, yeah, and there are, you know, the thing here's the thing. There are a, there besides me, and I'm biased about me, there are good <laughs> options. Sure. Right? There are people that um do it properly. Um, you know, it's just a matter of just finding the right fit at the end of the day. Um, and there's also other, you know, you, you know, either you've had a, other podcasts about all the different options there are these days too. So it's not that every film is right for a producer rep too. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's another thing I wanted to ask you. So like, yeah. because the specific kind of films because that go to a producer's rep, um, there are films that just don't need it. So like someone like, yeah. Someone like me who's been around the business, I've I've sold a few films. I've know I know a lot. I might not need my hand held nearly as much by someone like you right away. I mean, I can consult you and talk to you. Of course, I don't know everything, but I'm a little bit more savvy than your general filmmaker. Yeah. But as opposed to someone who's like living in Kansas, has never sold a movie, they just finished doing their first feature. It probably would benefit them to hire someone like you. Yeah, I think you know. I think definitely in the latter case. Mm-hmm. The other case I'll say is I do have producers I've worked with three to four times that come back to me to do what I do. Sure. Um, and they have learned a thing or two over time, but it's more of a personality thing. Like sure. they're just not that curious about it. You're you're a curious bird. You know, um, <laughs> a, stra- you, you a strange bird, sir. Like, a st- you know, exploring all the different angles of this business, right? So. <laughs> right. You're, it, you know, it, it kind of goes to self, the whole self-distribution thing too. Like people who, if you're going to self-distribute, it should be in your bones. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It should be something that you're like, wow, I really want to do this. I have the right kind of film for it and I know I can accomplish it. You know, mm-hmm. you really have to have that. You know, I've had some filmmakers who, you know, when they, when they're poking around uh, producer reps or sales agents, they ask me, you know, well, should I, do you think I should just self-distribute? I'm like, you know, if you have to ask me, you, you probably shouldn't, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you, pr- you should know you have to in right. order to self-distribute because it's, it's a uh, time consuming. You have to have Ugh. a passion for it, you know, um, yes. and you have to have the right kind of thing. I mean, there's a lot of films we see that most of the films we see aren't right for self-distribution because they're not 
there's no niche for it. Right. Um, and you would agree that I always tell people the same thing. Like if you're going to self distribute, it has to be really niche, like so niche that you can target that audience. A broad comedy self distribution, you're dead. You're just not going to yeah, make it. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, if you don't have, you know, broad comedy without an A list name and without, um, you know, a million dollars in the bank to, do your own PNA fund or something. Mm -hmm. And even then, you know, even then, you know, the, you know, betting on one film is a, is a, not a great investment mm -hmm. idea. <laughs> you, right. know, it's, right. um, it, you know, distributors pay, play a, you know, winners pay for losers game mm -hmm. in terms of they take out 20 films and three or four work to pay for all the other stuff. Right. Um, so betting, you know, even betting on one film as a filmmaker, you know, even if you have the money is, uh, is, you know, old borderline crazy, but, you know. <laughs> but we all are a little bit. That's, we just... all are. that's why we're here. <laughs> exactly. I know there is, I mean, that, that's a very good point. I mean, uh, I mean, I could, I, I, I self-distributed my first film, this is Meg. Uh, but then I still went with an international distributor for international sales and I did wraparound rights and right. All right. that kind of stuff afterwards, but it made sense because I had an audience. I was bringing them along for the process, totally. all that stuff, it, and, it, and it was a very low budget. I crowdfunded it. It all made sense, and it's something that I do. I know marketing. I know this. I can hit my audience, all that stuff. But you know, I had somebody coming to me the other day was like, "Hey, I have I have a two hundred fifty two hundred thousand dollar movie, and I'm I'm thinking of self distributing. We're really savvy marketing. I'm like, but you got a broad comedy, man. Like, right. I, I don't right. care how good you are." It's going to be tough to penetrate the audience and to get an ROI back. Even if you throw 60 grand at it, uh, at marketing, to get an ROI, that's, I mean, that's going to be yeah. tough. <laughs> it's, it's really kind of good, you know, bad money after bad <laughs> right. at that point. You know, it's, um, you know, if you have that kind of film, um, e either you've, you've struck the right chord and you're going to get the great festival and be one of 10 to 20% of the movies at that festival mm -hmm. that sells. And there's three or four of those mm -hmm. in terms of festivals. Mm -hmm. Um, or, um, you're probably, you know, you're most likely you're ending up with a, a good distributor that, um, maybe has the, you know, might do a little theatrical, um, just to prop it up and mm -hmm. you see, you know, one to 10 city type things out there mm -hmm. trying to help, you know, push the value. Um, or it's going to be a company that's purely going to give it the digital treatment and try to get it on cable, you know, and I mean, anybody can get on iTunes. So that's, you know, they, they would do that, but those kind of companies also try to, you know, broaden it out to cable VOD and then try to package to Netflix and Showtime and, and companies like that later, which gives, you know, a bit of a shot. But the revenue is, is most of the time pretty minute, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's distribution. And so you can say here, I've been distributed and la di da, but mostly <laughs> you're having to use it for pitching your next movie, you know, right. And not if you're sitting around waiting for the money to come in so you can finance your next movie. Oh, you'll be waiting for a while. You'll be waiting. It's not the night. It's not nineties. It's not the nineties anymore. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> In the '90s, I mean, there was so much money flowing around for independent film and for DVDs. I mean, not as not as because I remember in the '80s, literally, if you just made a movie in the '80s, it got distributed. You could get a 35 millimeter film made. Even there was a you you made money with it, almost. Yeah, no, it was crazy. <laughs> um, you know, Walmart Walmart bought movies and in massive amounts and and sold them. Um, it was, you know, you know, South Korea paid a hundred thousand dollars if you just ran around your backyard with your with your, you know, sixty millimeter camera. Oh and, my god! Can you and imagine? Bottle ketchup. <laughs> you know, um, that's insane. Nuts. That's insane. It was totally nuts. So now you also are an advocate for filmmakers at film festivals. Can you tell me what advocation for film festivals is and what you the truth about it? Because a lot of people have. A, yeah. lot, a lot of people think that, like, look, I, I, if anyone ever tells you, and I think you might agree with me, I can definitely get you into Sundance. Oh, right. I can definitely get you into Slam Dance I know, or yeah. South There by. used to be an agent at a, at that will remain nameless at an agency that will remain nameless who used to tell people, <laughs> I have three slots at Sundance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
That's so Jeffrey so... Gilmore was just letting him have three slots. He just walked in and put whatever movies he wanted in those Jesus, slots. Um, can you imagine? Yeah. Um, no, what, all, all, what it mostly is, is helping put a film on a radar. Um, uh, over the years, by selling movies and being at festivals, we've gotten to know a lot of the programmers. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at the big ones and the me- medium sized ones and not so much the, the smaller ones, but mm-hmm. you know, the, the ones that have some kind of value for a film niche or something like that. Yeah. And yeah. And, um, and so since we've gotten to know them, uh, we're chummy and can get them on the phone to say, Hey, um, you know, you should take a look at this movie. And all, all that really does is get a film its day in court at the end of the day. Right. Um, because the reality is that they say they watch all 10,000 movies that were submitted, Mm-mm. but there's absolutely no way they can. Um, and that doesn't mean that maybe some intern watched all, you know, maybe a, an army of interns and junior programmers watched it, but, um, uh, then it has to bubble, you know, then it has to, they have to like it, it has to bubble up to someone else who likes it. And what we can do is just make sure that someone, um, who has a true voice at the festival watches the movie. Um, it, I, I, you know, it's not so much that we, we certainly pitch it a little bit and try to say why we think it's great or mm-hmm. what's you, so unique about it or why it's good for their festival. But truly the, you know, it's going to be their experience watching the movie that determines whether they take it or not. It's not what it, and it's the same with selling movies, right? Like I can't, I can't convince my wife that a movie I just liked and she hates uh, is good is a good movie, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's 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 really ninety five percent plus them watching it and liking it and then it being likable enough that it rises to the top and whatever internal politics that that festival has mm-hmm. in terms of them fighting over like what films get accepted. Can you talk a little bit about those internal politics? Because I, I mean, I, I would love to get a little bit more of an insight from your point of view, at least an inside look at some of these festivals, because um, as we talked about right before we got on the phone, uh, before we got on the call was that, you know, of course on the corner of ego and desire was rejected from Sundance as 14,000 other films this year <laughs> got rejected from Sundance. And yeah. And, and, and I still argue as like, as, as if, as perfectly as a film could be set up to be at the Sundance Film Festival, a love letter to the Sundance Film Festival about, right. about right. filmmakers. I, you know, I don't know what else Come I could have, I could, I don't know what else I could give me a midnight slot. Just give me something. But it yeah. didn't, it didn't happen for me. And that's fine. But uh, there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. And uh, can you talk a little bit about that? So if people who are listening, don't feel so bad. The 14,000 of us that didn't make yeah. it this year. <laughs> well, the, the one thing you hear people say is like, oh, well, it's political. Yes. Right. Right. You know, the big guys get their films in. And, you know, I, I don't know that that's really true. I've known some pretty big wigs that got pissed off because their film didn't get in. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe some other film that they is part of their library got in and they're pissed off. It was that <laughs> film and not another film. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that you know, programmers are human beings that um, have their own subjective take on things and are um, uh, watch a lot of movies and then have to discuss them with their, the other people in there. And they're going to debate and go round and round in some places. It's, it's different. Like there are some festivals where it's, pu- it's truly egalitarian and there's 10 people that kind of get in a room and they all vote mm-hmm. on movies or give us, give scores on movies. And then the ones with the best scores rise to the top and then they vote. Mm-hmm. There's some where it's kind of top down, right? Where mm-hmm. there's a grand poobah and that person's really going to kind of get presented to him or her the, the, you know, the best of the, the best of the films. And then they're going to kind of say yes or no to what's been selected. So it kind of depends on the film festival a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reality is just like it's 14,000 movies, right? It it's was 14,200 movies this oh year. Oh, my God. It's a it's record just so, it's a, it's so many movies. I mean you can win it down a bit that it's you know 
a narrative feature film because some there's some shorts or some docs or some international. But still, <laughs> but still, it's okay. We've whittled it down to maybe three or four thousand movies, right? And um, that's just a lot of movies, and there's end up being maybe ten slots for your kind of movie, right? Um, it's a lottery ticket. And say it again. It's a lottery ticket. It is a lottery. It's totally a lottery ticket. But the problem is that everybody's like, well, what's the other, what's the alternative? And if you're talking about just traditional distribution and not self-distribution, you know, that's the only place where you really grab the brass ring as a mm -hmm. true indie, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not talking about films that have names in them that they are financed by international sales companies and they kind of, you know, there's a different game being played there. Mm -hmm. um, but just talking about true indie films made with your money or your family's money or dentist money or whatever, <laughs> um, you know, that's – that's the only place where you're going to get that, especially if you made a real indie film. Um, you know, the massive caveat to that is, you know, I, I do know indie filmmakers that put together, you know, if, if it's a horror film and it has a great art, arty angle to it and you get some, you know, maybe it's not a marquee name, but it's a meaningful name to the community. Um, you know, there's, there's a market there for that. Mm -hmm. If you make a family movie with a dog in it <laughs> mm -hmm. and you have the right kind of music and, the, and a certain level of cast, there's a market for it mm -hmm. without that. You know, both of those kind of movies are not made for Sundance mm -hmm. or South by, right? Mm -hmm. There's a market for those still. Um, it's a small market. So you still, you know, you have to make the move, those kind of movies for under 200 grand to hopefully, you know, recoup and you, and there, and you still can in those genres. Um, but you still have to do everything pretty right and be with the right distributor and get the right kind of deal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, um, you know, for, for, um, for your film that goes to, um, that's really meant like, you know, that's a drama or a dramatic thriller or, or a comedy or a rom-com or, or some kind of other artistic, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, genre, um, you, you know, you're not going to get a big deal unless you're in a situation where, you know, distributors sometimes make mistakes, uh, which are the major festivals. Because mm -hmm. the reality, too, is, you know, at Sundance, I don't know what the percentage is, but let's say, you know, 20 percent of the narrative features get a great deal where they have a big advance and a PA and a commitment, you know. Not all those movies are going to even do well. Oh, right. I mean, what was it? Uh, Sla was it Slave of a Nation or what was that movie? Yeah, 12, 12 Years of Slave. No, no, not 12 Years of Slave. The no, other, no, no, no. Yeah, you I know, know what you're talking about. Yeah, it was about the slave. Uh, yeah, oh God. They sold for like $12 million or $15 million. And then yeah, it, and then they had a controversy and it's died. It, you know, it's, it died. It, it, it died. Yeah. Um, and, but for even that, like that, and, you know, like, so there's Whiplash, right? Which has the great story of making the short and then they, um, sold the feature and then it did great. Mm -hmm. Um, and now he has a career. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's just one movie of the movies that were acquired out of that crop of films in Sundance. There are probably 10 others that got similar kind of deals that we don't remember, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. um, and where the filmmakers, because the film doesn't work like whiplash don't really have careers. Um, even with, Sundance success. Oh, I mean, know, so. I was involved with the movie uh, in 2010 that won two awards at Sundance, uh, and she couldn't get sold. I mean, and 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 she made it for about a hundred thousand. No cast, drama, quirky drama at that. Um, she was able to eventually make her money back selling, you know, airline rights, and Sundance put it on the Sundance Channel, and she got some money there, and Sundance kind of helped her, but. Overall, though, it was not a. Uh, it was. It was. It just could. It was regardless if it was Sundance or not. It just couldn't make yeah. money. It just wasn't. And that's. Yeah. And that's eight years ago. Yeah. Which is a lot more rosy than today. Yes. For that kind of movie. Yep. Too. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So it's. Um, you know, try not. Maybe I should get off of being Debbie Downer a little bit. <laughs> but, but, uh, 
but um, but look, this is uh, look. This is the reality. This is the reality of what yeah. we deal with. I mean, it, there are rah 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 times, and there's other times that we need to hear the truth, and that's why I bring yeah. guests like you on. And we don't worry, we'll talk about happy stuff in a minute. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, this is the truth of the matter. I mean, and people, yeah. don't you love people who? And I've had I've had filmmakers talk. I literally had this conversation with a filmmaker um, the other day. I'm like, what's your distribution plan for your hundred and fifty thousand dollar feature film? Oh, I'm submitting it to Sundance. Right. <laughs> that is the whole. That was the end all, be all. That was the end of the conversation. I'm like, what? What, what do you mean? Like, well, we're gonna get into Sundance, and then we'll get a deal, and then, you know, I'm like, are are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's you know, the, that's okay if you went to your investor and said, hey, we're probably throwing all your money away. Yes, exactly. Right. I mean. And certainly there are people that don't mind that, that that's, they just want to support you as a filmmaker or they love the idea or they sure. want, there's a cause behind it or something. And they sure. think, okay, this is represents less than 1% of my, my income a year. You know, mm-hmm. I've got it. So why not spend it? And I want to be in the film business. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, short of that, al- almost every representation of making money off of the film should be like, look, we're probably pissing it away. <laughs> um, and, the hard part too, though, also about like, you know, the, I've had people even, um, that, that know that they should probably try to raise some money along with their production budget to help distribute it, right. Mm-hmm. To help market it in mm-hmm. case mm-hmm. it doesn't get, um, Sundance or, or South by or something like that. The problem is, is that this, that's the first thing to go when they don't raise enough money, all the money. Right. Right. Um, and that almost always happens because you never raise everything that you hope you could mm-hmm. um, for a movie. And so a lot of times it's like, OK, we're just going to go ahead and make the movie regardless. So even I've had lots of people that knew that they should do that, but they just don't. You know, it's just hard to raise every dollar you you think you need. And and then things happen in production, too. Like, you know, like, you know, oh, well, that's going to cost a lot more than we thought. In the, you know, what do you, what do you, happen. what do you mean? The, I have to, I'm creating an entire, uh, you know, Hobbit village, uh, in post. <laughs> what do you mean? $5,000 isn't enough. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. it's, it's usually marketing money. Then the next thing that gets cut off is color grading, um, yes. sound. All oh, the all the posts starts getting drizzled down to like, well, I'll just edit it on my laptop and I'll you just know, strum a guitar in the background. I'll strum a guitar in the background <laughs> and, uh, and I need a 4K uh, DCP with that. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, it's, it's exactly just, right. And it's just the, uh, it's just, uh, it's it's sad. It's sad, but that's what that's what I'm trying to help with with indie film hustle. I'm trying to get the information out there so people don't make these mistakes, the mistakes that I've made and, and mistakes that my guests have heard or made themselves in the. In the yeah. Time. No, it's um, no, I've I've watched a lot of your videos. It's it's. I, I wish everybody knew about it. You know, that was, it, it's, it's almost that the, like once they um, graduate from film school, they should all have to sit down and watch hours and hours of indie film hustle <laughs> Thank um, you. because that's the real education at the end of the day beyond yeah. knowing, you know, where the, you know, what the 180 degree, to, what the 180 degree is and the rule of thirds is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Once they know that and they know how to wrap a cable and make a good cup of coffee, they actually need to know how the business runs. That's right. Or, um, you know, you know the history of the French New Wave cinema, which is fantastic, is. and I've I I and I loved Absolutely. I loved watching it, but that does not help me with distribution today. <laughs> totally. Now, speaking of distribution, what is hybrid and, and theatrical distribution? Because I know you guys help with that as well. Yeah. So. Um... What hybrid usually is, um, hybrid just means you're doing traditional and self-distribution together in some way. Mm-hmm. And that, that can mean a lot of different things. So um, sometimes I, I've had a few filmmakers who got traditional distribution in terms of a distributor taking the film out to the various digital platforms, try, you know, running with the Blu-ray, trying to sell um, Showtime and, and other other platforms downstream and then the filmmaker will go off and do their own theatrical to try to support that. Um, that's one version of hybrid distribution. Mm -hmm. Um, another version that I used to see more often was, and I see less often today is, uh, 
um, selling your own Blu-ray or DVDs in a, in, at the same time that your your distributor is doing it mm-hmm. their way. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's just dropped off because less people watch films that way. Mm-hmm. And so I have less filmmakers wanting to try that. Um, and, and that and, and hybrid could also just mean, though, um, that you're going to you, you have a distributor um, and maybe they're they've got an in-house publicist who's working that angle, but they're not really spending anything on Facebook ads or something that you feel like would help the cause. Mm-hmm. And so you can coordinate with them um, in that way. Or it could be the reverse. They're going to spend some money on some ads in some way, but they don't really have any publicists. So you hire someone or do, or try to do some publicity yourself at the same time. Um, so those are the different kinds of hybrid distribution deals that we've, um, you know, helped contractually um, pull off for people if that was their, you know, if that was their inclination. Now you've, you've mentioned a lot about the digital platforms like SVOD, TVOD, AVOD. What, what are you feeling? What is your feeling today for independent filmmakers actually being able to recoup money through those platforms, whether as self-distribution or even in traditional distribution? What are the differences between the two? Because at the end of the day, you know, we can get our film up on iTunes tomorrow. And if you go with a distributor, they can get their their film on iTunes tomorrow. What is the big difference between the two? Like why would I give 20% or 30, 40, 50% depending on how yeah. bad the deal is to a distributor if I'm going to do this marketing and I'm going to push it? What's the point? What, tell me what your feeling is on totally, it. Totally, totally. Yeah, I mean there are definitely scenarios where you shouldn't give it to a traditional distributor if if all they're going to do is put it on iTunes. Mm-hmm. Um, that makes no sense. Um, and there are some distributors out there that say, Hey, we're going to do all this stuff. And they just don't, they purely just put it on iTunes and they're taking 20 to 30% just for doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and recouping ridiculous costs and then so, yeah, and, and holding it for seven, holding it hostage for seven years. Yeah. <laughs> so there's all sorts of scenarios that you should avoid and not do. Um, and that self-distribution would be a better than, than doing, you know, it, traditionally with somebody else, the the reason to go with the traditional distributor, um, there's there's several reasons that can be combined together. Um, any one of which might make someone do it. So um, one is, if you are completely out of money, um, and a distributor will at least do the encoding. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you have zero dollars and they will do the encoding and perhaps they'll pay for the insurance. And maybe there's a couple other costs that you just don't have. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, giving away 20 percent for what can be five to 10 grand in costs might be valuable to you because that's where you are. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the end of the day, if you're thinking of, oh, I'll just put it on my credit card and I'll just get up on the platforms. No. If you don't have any more money left you're done. to support it or the time and effort to support it, you're just throwing away more money. So you might as well have them throw away the money. Um, the other, the secondly, um, there are some distributors that, uh, have the muscle to get better placement in the digital hemisphere than others. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean that if you self-distribute, you won't get good placement because that has happened, but it's also possible that you don't. And what's hard about it. It's also possible to be with a big studio and the placement not end up being great either. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. not a guarantee, mm-hmm. but over time and looking at this stuff, we see that in general, there are some companies that just get better placement over time, even for their indie films than others. And so when we're going out to distributors and we're getting the offers that part of the Intel that we're able to share with our filmmakers, Hey, here's, you know, how they have positioned their films in the past and how they made more money than you probably would Mm -hmm. with this other distributor. Um, in addition, there are some distributors that, that do marketing. Mm -hmm. Um, now for films that are just a digital release that could be, as limited as um, having an in-house publicist and right. or paying for some Facebook ads. Mm-hmm. Um, and so 
you know, again, if you don't have the money for a publicist and you don't have the money for buying Facebook ads and you don't think that the company making the offer to you can get better position than you can through an aggregator, then, and you don't, and you don't have any money, it's probably best to go with the, the distributor. Mm-hmm. Um, and then up from there, the, the hard thing to it though is, and it's always, you know, you always have to be, whenever we're advising about this, it always gets more granular and specific because we're talking about particular companies and what they do. And mm-hmm. none of these companies are the same in their strategies, in their relationships, sure. in their practices, in their ethics, in their contracts. So it's not, it's just not that cookie cutter. And, um, and so, and they're always changing over time. So we're constantly having to like relook at them every month and say, <laughs> what are they doing now? You know, and what did they do last month for that film? Um, so, um, and, and certainly you can't just go off of what they tell you they're going to do. Uh, you have to look at their past practices to see what they did mm-hmm. and find out from filmmakers what they did to see if they actually did these things like, you know, cause some people will say like, Oh yeah, we're going to do a whole social media thing. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what that ends up meaning is that they put it on their Facebook page, right? right. Here's the movie. <laughs> and they did, that's it. Which right? has, like, which, oh, has which has 500, which has 500 followers. <laughs> yeah. And what, did they even see it? No, of course not. <laughs> because Unless... they come up in their thing. So, um, you have to, you know, you have to know how to talk to these people and and see what they've actually done. Do they actually buy Facebook ads? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Did they actually do a targeted campaign to the demographic for that film? Um, Now the jump up from there now for that digital type play, you know, if someone's saying they're going to spend a hundred thousand dollars to market your, your um, digital only movie, Right. Then they're lying. Right? right. No one spends that amount of money to market a digital only movie. Correct. And um, if that's what your statement looks like. It's it's incorrect. So the, the jump from someone spending, you know, thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of dollars on publicity and marketing mm-hmm. to um, a bigger level is if it's theatrical. Right. And not that every theatrical is big, but. <clears throat> or, or even going for box office, but that's the only time you ever see a truly robust marketing spend is if they're trying to support a theatrical of a certain size. Right. Um, and then that of course is where it's kind of obvious that to me, at least that, you know, if you have someone wanting your film at that level, you just got to, you got to hope get the best terms you can and hope that they can do it properly and that it beats all the other films because you doing that is not going to be even close to the same. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, that's, that's the, the difference. That's the difference. That is a nutshell. That's a very large nutshell. nutshell. (laughs) (laughs) Without question. No, without question. I mean, it's, it's true. A lot of the stuff you just said, uh, you know, is, such inside information <laughs> that only like you and I sitting down at Sundance over a drink might talk about. Uh, and it's generally that stuff that people talk about outside. So thank you for, for sharing that. Man. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, there, there's, I mean, there's so much, there's so many shady deals. There's so many, uh, you know, there's much more shady than are reputable uh, in all parts of our business. I think from my experience, at least, there are really good companies out there, really good distribution companies out there who have uh, really good ethics. Um, but I, I think you might agree with me that there's probably a lot more that don't. <laughs> and we have to be careful. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if I know if I can even quantify it, though, because I don't, I don't run into it very much. Mm-hmm. You know, when we, most of the films that we take on are referred to us. Mm-hmm. And, um and so we don't find ourselves like competing per se, like, oh, well, are we going to get it? Or is, you know, this other company going to get it? Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes we find out after the fact that someone went with a criminal mm-hmm. and we just 
shake our heads, but uh, <laughs> most of the time, you know, we're just moving on to another film and trying to, you know, work with other filmmakers. So it's, it's actually kind of hard for me to, to gauge like how much, how much is criminal and how much is, mm-hmm. is real. And, and part of it too is like, you know, truly it's hard for even the people who do it legitimately. And quite often, even the legitimate companies get blamed for what happens. And uh, yeah, like you said earlier, the day is just a hard business. It's just a really hard business to make to turn a film into, you know, something that um, makes money. It's just very, very hard. Why do we do it, man? Why are we here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't understand. Well, like, I, I mean, you're, you're. I mean, you've also produced a lot of films over the years as well. So you, you are not just a producer's rep. You also do many other things. But at the end of the day, like, why? Why do we do this to ourselves? I know. <laughs> well, I think if we hadn't grown up when we grew when we grew up, right? Um, I mean, I say that, but then there are people coming out of college now who want to be filmmakers, and maybe it's a smaller slice of the population that it was when we were young, but it still happens. Oh, I think people. it's a larger. I think it's a much larger. Size. Well, I think I think there's more people because there's more people. Mm-hmm. But I think there are more like more people are in like there weren't people wanting to get in and make games when we were when at least when I was young. No, of course, there, right? You know what I mean? There weren't people wanting to be game, you know, developing games. There's just mm-hmm. a lot, you know, or or other kinds of art media and, right. and media, right? So I and I don't have any numbers. I just my instinct is that the, as a percentage, it's smaller. <laughs> it's like in the '50s, the big thing was to be an author. You know what I mean? Right. Like, and the authors were kind of rock stars. Um, and then in the seventies and eighties and maybe nineties, you know, filmmakers yeah. were, were rock stars. And I don't know who, I mean, now YouTube YouTubers, stars, yes, YouTubers, right. right. The, yeah. the rock stars. So it's just a different, it's a different world. So I think we're a smaller slice of the population, mm-hmm. but it's still a heavy number. Um, there's still a lot of people who grew up loving movies and, Wanting to be a part of it in some way, and mm-hmm. oh, look that film, you know, Whiplash or whatever. They made a movie. I can make a movie. You know, we all have that feeling. That isn't we can it? Do it. Isn't it amazing though that that we're like one of the few people of or, or art forms. I mean, I would assume books as well, uh, uh, being an author. But it's like you watch a movie and you say, "Hey, I can do that," or you read a book and you're like, "Hey, I could write a book." Um, but you never see like I heard a Mozart. I can write a symphony. Like it doesn't. <laughs> you stop there. You see, like there's a, yeah. Like I I've, I've walked into a building. I think I can build one. Like there's not yeah. those conversations. But for whatever for reason, our art form specifically, anyone who watches a movie because we've seen it so many times. Like I've seen so many movies. I'm sure I can make a bit. I can make a movie. That's good. Absolutely. And <laughs> and the means to get there has gotten easier too, right? We can make it on our phone now mm-hmm. and edit it on our computer. Mm-hmm. So the access is it's it is a lot simpler just to do you know just to do that. So you you know I get movies all the time. You know we get people referred to us with movies that just literally they made on the, with their phone or something, mm-hmm. and they you know the acting's terrible and the lighting's terrible, no and the story. stories like whatever. Mm-hmm. And um and so you know that's that's definitely the bottom of the barrel. And there's all different levels of bad. Um, <laughs> yes, but, there is. Um, <laughs> There's an ocean of awful out there, but it's, uh, um, you know, the, the, the thing is, it's all subjective at the, end of the day. And, you know, when I made shorts with my brother, when I was 13, mm-hmm. I thought they were amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen, when I was, when I was growing up at the video store, I thought John claude Van Damme was the greatest actor of all time. So, <laughs> you know, times a change. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and and um, and yeah, so I think it. I, I think it's partly that it's like it's you. You can accomplish at least something, mm-hmm. and that makes you feel like it's possible. Yeah, I get Whereas, you. like you know, programming a game. I you know, <laughs> I can't even I know begin, the first I, thing I, about programming anything. I can't you know even I mean? begin so to it, think the about access it. Access is not there unless you learn, you go and really study it and learn it. Absolutely. Now, what when you guys are taking on films, what do you look for in a film to actually take it on as a client? I, you know, it's, it's different things. Um, it's certainly like the bottom line, we have to feel like there's a place for it, Mm -hmm. right? We have to feel like there's a, you know, what we, that we're the appropriate company for the movie and that there's a, um, 
whether it's a, you know a whether it's theatrical or it's a, a, a company that does a little bit more than just place it on a platform we have to feel like we add value that way mm-hmm. um so that's number one. N- number two, um, I gotta like the movie to a certain degree. <laughs> I don't have to think it's you know gone with the wind, but um, I have to pitch it you know to distributors and and share it with distributors, and they have to, I have to hope that they'll call me back over right. time. Right, because if you take a crappy film and you say this is fantastic, they're never gonna yeah. take your call. And again. certainly, I've also had films where we thought, well, this is. This is not for the top tier theatrical distributors, but it could go to a good digital distributor. And as long as the filmmaker understands that that's what we're going to try and that's where we think it can go, then we can help them. Mm -hmm. Um, But we certainly have turned down films where we turn in lots of films because they're not very good. Mm -hmm. And we turn out, we have also turned down films because they think that they're going to get you know, Fox Searchlight <laughs> to put it on 400 screens, sure. you know, and they're just totally delusional. They may even have a good movie, but that's just not going to happen for them. Uh, um, let's, we, should, we could do a whole episode on delusional filmmakers. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, we could. oh my God. The, the stories I've heard, the things I've seen. And, yes. and listen, I was a delusional filmmaker when I was coming up. I mean, we all have, you have to be a certain level of delusion yeah. and crazy to do what we do. Absolutely. But there is that, the, the reality wall that sets in. Like, you know, I just spent a million dollars on a film with no stars shot in black and white. Um, that is Shape of Water meets E.T. with Transformers drizzled on top, um, <laughs> which is yeah. which is the movie yeah. that, by the way, that is the movie that my actors or my my cast was trying to pitch in the movie Ego and Desire. That's the exact pitch for it. I don't think you've ever heard that pitch. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> mostly in black and white, mostly a little bit in slow mo, and it's like a mixture between like a Truffaut and a Criterion collection. <laughs> yes, oh, sounds delicious. Um, I. You know, it was hard. What's hard, though, too, what's what's harder than that, though, is the film that you like. Okay, yeah, this could get a little distributor Mm -hmm. to do something little for them, and they don't want to self distribute. And maybe they'll put it on one screen, or maybe it's just a really good release, and they'll sell it to you know Showtime or Netflix or somebody later. It's got a chance, Mm -hmm. but they just don't. They just think it's more than that. They think it's a little bit more than that, and it's. And what's hard is I want the film, but you can't, you know, you just can't go there in terms of like right. saying like, you know, yeah, you've got a, you've got a chance. And that's, and I think that, you know, going back to our, you know, you're talking about um, cheesy producer reps mm-hmm. that are out there that are some that will just blow the smoke up the butt because at the end of the day, when it does not work, they're mm-hmm. still going to be on the film as the producer rep. And get to make the deal regardless. And we've lost films over being honest with people about what the chances are. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it, you know, even more hard to, um, you know, when to your question of like what we what we see in a movie, Mm -hmm. it's 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 thinking there's a place it's digging it. And it's also like feeling out the filmmaker to make sure they're just in the right frame of mind, you know. You, know, you have to like, you have to check their expectations because if their it, expectations it, right. uh, absolutely you know mm-hmm. because um, if they if they think that it's definitely going to be on Netflix for you know as original content and, and at know, least Netflix a two hundred fifty thousand what they bought yeah two hundred fifty thousand dollar buy <laughs> yeah it's just you know yeah. it's not it's just not they're not doing that anymore and so um it's funny I you know we sometimes spend you know two hours talking to people, you know, maybe in two different conversations to educate them about the business, only not to get the business because we've talked them, you know, we've kind of like spoiled the whole world for them. You know, they, now well, they're just like, well, I can't, they don't believe my film is for Fox Searchlight. So I'm going to go do it elsewhere. Well, now all you have to do is just send them a link to this episode. <laughs> so, so helpful. <laughs> What do you I owe to, you? Exactly. You're just like, listen, just listen to this. When you're done listening to this, if you still want to talk to us, we can That's talk right. to you a little bit more. But this is the reality of what's going to happen. So true. I can just hit play. Oh, my God. 
Fantastic. <laughs> so listen, tell me about your company, Circus Road, and, and what you guys do. So we're 95% of what we do um, is help filmmakers get distribution. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's helping them advocate to film festivals to prop it up. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's doing um, uh, just going straight to distributors. Sometimes it's trying to push distributors into a screening room at South by. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's all different strategies for different films. And it just kind of depends on how we feel about it and how the filmmaker feels about it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we, um, you know, we, we generally represent three or four films at a time. Um, we don't really have like a minimum or a maximum for a number of films that just kind of happens to be what we're usually working on. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, um, and then, you know, I also have the, the legal background, so I help them with the contract and I negotiate it and redline it and, and do the back and forth to try to get the best deal. And then downstream, we also help filmmakers understand their royalty reports and get their distributor on the phone. If they haven't, um, you know, they won't call them back. <laughs> what? Um, That's what that doesn't believe it or not, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, <laughs> There are lots of great distributors that call people back out there, but there are some, you know, no, no distributors perfect. They've all, everyone has their kinks and some is just, you, they need to kick in the butt to call somebody sometimes. Right. Um, and you're the boot. So it's a little bit of that. So we, we kind of feel like when we're on a film, we're kind of in it for the long term um, with people, depending on, you know, how it goes. Mm -hmm. And, um, and quite often clients have turned in, you know, I, I do um, a little bit of, producing but i'm not a nuts and bolts guy i'm not on the set mm -hmm. you know doing that gig mm -hmm. um it's more that um i've either had a property and a friend of mine had a found someone with some money for it or a friend of mine has a property and i found some someone with some money for it mm -hmm. and we help cobble it together maybe maybe there's a pre-sale or someone who does a pre-sale involved um to help put it together but mostly it's been Every film has been just a little bit different in terms of how we've put it together. Um, but fortunately, I, you know, my role, if I were to be an onset guy, I can do the sales part of this whole thing too. So it yeah. doesn't occupy a lot of my time. I, I, I read a script here and there trying to find something interesting to work on, but um, it's a pretty small part of what we, uh, what we do. Well, Glenn, uh, now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. Um, yes. What advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Wanting to break into the business today, I would say um, a filmmaker. So uh, I would say try to get a job in the industry. Um, doesn't have to be related to exactly what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, but to learn another angle maybe as opposed, you know, maybe you're, you know, if you're, if you're, if you want to direct, write and direct movies, um, it's, it's hard, like just having a great script, um, and trying to get a manager and agent, that's a hard road. No. Um, rough. And I think, um, getting into the business in some way and then networking within the business while you're pursuing all that just increases your odds a little bit of being able to do something um, and try to go to the bigger festivals, try to go to some of the markets if you can afford it mm -hmm. um, just to see how, how things work and to try to meet people and network. That's um, that's how a lot of the people that I've seen become successful do it who didn't, you know, start off. I mean, I've seen some people who had money to make their first movie and it was great and, off to the races, mm -hmm. but, um, that's not the, that's not, you know, most people don't have that. So I would say just try to try to network, try to meet people, try to be a part of the action in some way, um, while you're trying to pursue your dream. Very good advice. Very good advice. Now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Holy crap. Now, it's just like, these are some deep questions to prepare. you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, I can't say the Bible because that's <laughs> not my, my speed. Um, 
and I probably just lost a few clients there. That's um, <laughs> <laughs> and scene. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to say, um, you know, what was, uh, uh, if I could maybe a category of books, the, mm-hmm. the, the works of Henry James was a big oh, yeah. influence on me when I was, um, in, uh, getting my English degree at NYU, mm-hmm. I, um, had a course just on, uh, Henry James and, um, just it prompted me to read all his stuff. And I think it just, it made me a better reader of everything. And I think it also probably propelled me to law school a little bit because, and, 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 and increased my ability to read in general. Mm-hmm. Um, Good. I'm not sure what, I think partly I grew up in England as a kid mm-hmm. and mostly from Texas though. And Henry James had this, um, uh, English, um, and American, um, kind of hybrid life. Um, so I connected to that, but just thought he was a great writer and, and, I guess it influenced me in several several ways. Okay. Now, what lesson took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, Jesus! I'm, t- I'm, t- I'm telling you. <laughs> um, my um, goal, my goal here is to bring down Circus Road by you not being able to answer these questions. <laughs> <laughs> Working. Um, lesson that I learned it took me the longest to learn. Um. Well, I, I think I probably got there in my 30s, which is so many years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was probably just to um, let some arguments lie and not have to win every battle. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think that, that that has served me well it it certainly you know doing what i do requires a lot of patience um both with filmmakers who don't understand maybe every detail of the business and with distributors who struggle and are having a hard time getting great you know getting the films out mm-hmm. and i think um taking them taking them being able to understand other people's situations and being able to the only way I got there, I think, was over time being through those situations myself. And so I think if I can if I can sum that up, it's 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 taking the time to hear someone else's side of things and trying to understand it. That I think has served me the best. Very cool. Now, of course, this is the, the last question, the most t- the toughest one of them oh, all. God. OK. Three of your favorite films of all time. La Antalante. Okay. Jean Vigo. Okay. Um, this is Spinal Tap. Genius. Rob Reiner. Genius. And uh, I'm going to say oh, I've got a tie. Go for it. Okay. Uh, the Earrings of Madame De. Okay. I haven't heard dot, that dot, one. Dot. And um, I'm going to pick a Martin Scorsese one because I love Martin Scorsese. <laughs> um, I'll say, um, oh god, uh, Mean Streets. Mean Streets over Goodfellas. Yeah, I just love how raw it is. It is pretty damn raw, isn't it? Ugh. You know, I love how that raw was it indie. Is. That was indie movies when when oh, indie really? when indie movies were being made. You know. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's a great film. Great film. And now, where can people find you, Glenn? So, um, my uh, website is circusroadfilms.com. My email is Glenn. Oh, don't do it. In, don't do it. Don't, don't do it, Glenn. Don't do it. Don't. I, I promise you they're going to. Okay, go ahead. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. If you put your email out, you will get emails. So prepare That's yourself. I, I'm all, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm open for business. So, <laughs> prepare prepare um, yourself. <laughs> it's Glenn, G-L-E-N, which is the proper way to spell Glenn, uh-huh. at circusroadfilms.com. That's the best way to get me. All right, Glenn, man, it's been an absolute pleasure talking shop with you. And, and thank you for dropping these knowledge bombs on the, the tribe today. I really appreciate you taking out the time. Oh, thank you, Alex. This is great. Really appreciate it. I want to thank Glenn again for coming by and dropping some major, major knowledge bombs on the Indie Film Hustle tribe today. Thank you, Glenn, so, so much. And as I warn you, Glenn, you put out your email, you will get 
emails from the tribe, <laughs> no question. So guys, be kind. But you know, if you're interested and you need his services, please be my guest and uh, and email him. I'll put the links to everything we talked about, links on how to get a hold of him, uh, that email and everything on the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 303. Now, there has been a little bit of confusion in regards to my book release date. Right now on Amazon, it says it's been released, but it has not yet been released. It will be released March 8th. As of right now, my publisher is trying to deal with the demand, believe it or not. So uh, if you have, have you, if you've ordered it, it will be coming out in the next few weeks. So please be patient. Thank you again so, so much. If you're part of my launch team and you have read the book, you can now go to Amazon.com and leave a good review for the book. And it means so, 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 so much to me that you do that. So please just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash mob, and that'll take you directly to the Amazon page. And there you can leave a review. And please share it with as many people as you possibly can. And again, thank you guys so, so much for all the support. And that's the end of another episode of the Indie Film Hustle podcast. Thank you guys again so, so much. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.